Yeah. All right. This is Brooke from Printabot Live, and uh, we're live on Facebook. Later, we'll be live on YouTube. Got to get my up update <coughs> list out here. All right. First thing I wanted to do was uh, we've got talk about this in a second. First thing I want to do is give a shout out to a couple of companies. The first being Ulta Machine. Johnny over at Ulta Machine is uh, the guy that's known for the Rambo board, the Rambo Mini, the ENC. He does the stuff for, well anyway, he makes a lot of boards. And we've sold our pick and place machine here. We sold it a few months back. And so we're in the transition to having Ulta Machine make all of our electronics. And so that's really their specialty. you got to check their site out if you want an electronics board. Um, I didn't tell him I was going to recommend that, so I'd love him to be surprised with an increase in sales because what a great guy. Uh, the transition for PrinterBot to use them, they're based in the U.S. and they do great work and I've just been impressed with him ever since I met him. And uh, he's a great guy. I can't wait to get my first shipment, but he's been so patient with me and persistent to get the F6 boards made there, and we're also transitioning, or we're running out of uh, GT, I'm sorry, I always say that, G2 boards, the printer board G2, and the hub, uh, the printer hub, uh, th that'll be the first couple shipments for the new printer, the Simple Pro. I guess not so new anymore, but anyway, it's our flagship model, so he's gonna, making, he's gonna be making all of our electronics, and wanted to give a shout out to Johnny, what a great guy. Look forward to seeing him at the RepRap What's it called? The, the Rep Rap, Midwest Rep Rap Festival. Yeah, I will be there. So uh, that's Ultima Machine. The second one was I got to spend some time with Mosaic Manufacturing this week. And a couple of the guys came, two to three. And those are great guys. If you haven't heard of Mosaic Manufacturing, they're the guys that make the palette and uh, these multicolored prints. Now, I know that there's you know, we've got uh, a two-into-one system that, it's not here anymore, um, that, you know, you can, it's open source and retrofit, but I got to say that the software hasn't really caught up with multi-material printing. This is just a various colored bear. I've shown you, I've shown these before, but what I'm so impressed with in the Mosaic manufacturing system, the palette, I think they have the palette, the palette plus, and they're working on finishing the uh, palette two. Um, so, just really cool. I've always liked multi-material printing very little. <laughs> because it was so hard. Um, I've had printers that had up to three heads, and it was almost impossible. I mean, it's hard to model for, it's hard to do the calibration when you have three separate discrete heads for each color or material. You got to dial them in separately, and they have to line up perfectly. It's a big pain. And uh, there's a there's a video out there uh, with me and Steve uh, trying to get a dual head printer all dialed in. It's just a pain. So the cool thing about Mosaic Manufacturing is they have this machine. Now it is uh, proprietary. They have IP. They have patents. Um, so it's not open source. So there's two camps. I never buy open. I, I never buy anything but open source, and I don't care if it works. I'm an open source guy, you guys know that. But when it comes to multi-material, you really need new software to be able to do that and manage all of the, the intricacies of printing in multi multiple materials or colors uh, to really help that become easy. And one of the major advances that they've done is they've got this filament, where is it? They've got this filament. It, I call it a welder, but uh, they probably call it something else. And what they do is they take in four colors or materials, and they take two separate materials, and they do this joint with, uh, you know, they heat it up and, like, weld it together. And that's the magic of their machine. So you end up with a single strand of filament coming into your machine. So now that, that add-on box for, like, anybody that runs Marlin or can recognize Marlin like our G2, uh, this becomes easier because you don't have to calibrate the two heads. You know, one head, the Ultimaker 
Team Tilt Maker. It uses this thing where it kind of springs up and down so it gets out of the way. One gets out of the way while one's spinning and then it switches. But the other one can still uh, ooze. Now, I'm not saying theirs does. Maybe does, maybe doesn't. But, you know, that uh, up and down motion adds a requirement to your electronics. And if you don't have another axis to move it up out of the way or a spring or some kind of electronics to, to move it, a lot of dual printing machines are just side by side and the nozzle does it very so you can drag across. Now you can do Z-hop um, to help that, but while it's printing, it's going to be right there at the same level as the other nozzle. So how do you, how do you make that simple? Well, one company moves the, uh, the second extruder off to the side and parks it. Now you got more cost, you've still got calibration, you know, for this offset. Uh, there's time involved, they got to move things out of the way. And Mosaic is uh, really clever because it, you just have to manage one. So all 3D, pr I say all, most 3D printers um, would be able to add on this box and it, you know, listens to what line it's on and it kind of recalibrates as it goes so that you get this uh, color change happening. Um, right now they have a tower off to the side and they, they've got some advances coming with that. But uh, now, I know Prusa uh, announced that he's got a new way of doing things. He, he, I read his newsletter and he said, um, I've got bad and good news. Uh, bad news is we're dumping the old multicolor extruder, you know, system. And he'd been struggling. I'll let him speak for himself, so go read his blog. But I know that he was hoping to bring that out a long time ago. I saw it at Maker Faire, and the prints that he was getting were beautiful. But I guess he was hesitant to release it. Maybe it was firmware or he wanted to dial it in a little better or something, but he, he, I guess, just threw that aside and has this new system where the picture shows a lead screw and a, a feeder tube that goes down to a direct drive, I believe, um, so his regular printer, the i3. And uh, I guess this, I'm making assumptions here, but I guess this thing rifles over to, you know, multi-material uh, or multiple colors. And so it's a different system. It's mechanical. There's going to be some wait time involved. He's got to retract the filament all the way up, and then he's got to retract or push it back down, engage it with a new color. So there's going to be, uh, you know, a bit of a time um, cost to pay for doing multiple materials. And anytime you move mechanically, there's chances for failure. Well, Mosaic doesn't have that. They have one piece of filament coming in, and it's just going to feed, and it's going to... Uh, I'm making some assumptions here, too, because I didn't, you know, I don't look at the code or anything. I probably signed an NDA, but I don't remember what I, what I agreed to. I think uh, they just don't want to give specifics, but I don't really even know any. Um, but the idea is uh, to make sure that there's not drift across, you know, you can imagine that with all of these color changes, they're trying to eliminate or at least reduce the amount of color changes down to the bare minimum so it saves time, but... You know, there could be a section of this that isn't exactly correct if you just left the whole filament to come out and it's an eight-hour print. You might be a little bit off when, uh, so they have a system that um, makes sure that every layer is adjusted. It's just impressive. And so the guys are great, um, and I enjoyed the time with them. So thank you, Mosaic Manufacturing. Go check out their palette plus, I think. And uh, I am awaiting their uh Palette 2. So while we haven't made any deals yet, um, I'm hoping to bring out a new printer that incorporates their four material, four color uh, box right in with the printer, at least as good as I can, because it's a separate box. So it'll hang off the side or be under a cover or something. But uh, And I've really asked them, you know, what is it that these, because I'm, I'm sure they're making deals with other printer manufacturers. But I would love to be the poster child for the perfect printer to work with Mosaic Manufacturing's four color. So I know people have been asking me about it, but the, the printer I'm going to make is uh, a little bit different than the Simple Pro in this way. It will be a box. And the reason I shied away from that is I just hate, I, I hated all the big boxes. But over time, as I've done some box uh, designs, um, I could get those really pretty small. And we make in metal, so that helps us stand out amongst the competition. I mean, you might be able to stand on an Ultimaker while it's printing, but I kind of doubt it. Um, 
you know, I know you can't stand on a Prusa when you print. You might be able to on a Rollsbot. There's some skew in that frame. But they have printed parts. So I, I pride myself in the designs that we make are very, very robust. And so to have a really strong printer that's uh, in a box, that's extremely rigid, machine material, no printed parts, the mosaic uh, four color system. Um, and I'm gonna make some improvements to uh, the, the power that comes, uh, delivers the filament in the extruder. Um, an update to the gearhead, uh, probably call it the gearhead two. Um, some changes, because this uh, system needs to be auto feeding. And so when you, you know, uh, mosaic pushes their filament through the feeder tube, you just have to accept it without any pinch or anything like that. So um, I want to keep the screen. Uh, so anyway, I'm pretty excited about uh, getting rolling on a new design with multicolor, multi-material uh, printing. So just a little teaser, but um, I'm just glad they came down and got excited about that. Uh, I think they need a manufacturer that um, has a great hot end, a great extruder, um, very rigid, made in the U.S. They're Canadian, by the way. Um, and I won't hold that against them at all. I love Canadians. So anyway, I uh, wanted to just give a shout out to them, so check them out. Um, let's see. Also, uh, shout out to my buddy Mick. So he was our programmer. He did the UI and all kinds of programming for um, all kinds of things. Um, but he's off on his own as a consultant now, working, working in, uh, for himself. And uh, we're still friends. We meet up. And he shot me this link last night. And Dave, if you want to uh, share the, I don't know how you're going to share the hex link. But basically, he took an old printer board and that he, excuse me, he's working on a project, or maybe he did it for fun. I don't know. But we have uh, this little extension that we sold for the micro SD to come out to that old LCD, 20 character by four line um, LCD. And we were doing various things to try to get that micro SD card broken out to a different location on the printer for the prosthetics and, and anybody that has one of those things. There's this really expensive cable, um, this little tiny ribbon cable that went from, it was just a plug into the micro SD and it broke out to a larger SD card so you can relocate the position of that. Cause in some of our printers, it's hard to reach. And those micro SD cards are a little finicky, hard to keep a hold of and get it in and out of the slot with the case in the way and all that. So he sent me this link, and I'm going to have Dave post it. Um, these USB, I'm sorry, these micro, they're not even micro, the full-size SD card slots you can get on eBay. Or they're from China. But if you order in bulk, they're like 40 cents. Maybe they're a couple bucks if you buy them in singles. But he changed the firmware on the, uh, basically he had to change one pin, uh, he had to reallocate one pin on, uh, he used the ISCP, I think I'm saying that right, I'm not sure though. Anyway, so he used some pins that we don't use, and he used one off of EXP1, and he was able to get that SD card, that 40 cent card, to work with the printer board so he can relocate that SD card slot. <coughs> Pretty cool. Wanted to put a link to uh, both the eBay. Did I send? I think I sent you the email for that. There's a link that Dave will post. Maybe we can get a blog post on this. Um, just a short post that says, hey, here's a hex file if you want to play with this. Um, I'm not going to support it or anything. It's just for fun. But if you are frustrated with that little micro SD and the location that it's in, you could break that out somewhere else. And what's nice about that is, uh, you know, we don't even sell, I don't think, the LCD panels anymore. Um, they were very nice. But if you want to just use a, uh, you know, like a cheap Chinese 20 character by 4 character LCD with the knob, that's nice. You can locate that out in front of your printer. But now what about the SD card slot? Well, this solves that problem separately, but you could use them in unison and spend very little money. Uh, there is also, I don't know if I ever published this, Dave. When I was screwing around with the, um, the Chinese LCDs, did we ever post about the, uh, the Chinese, like they were $15 or $10 LCD screens? I'll, I'll put that, give me a reminder tomorrow, and I'll post the pinout for, there, there is a board out there. I left it in my car. But it's a little bitty board that plugs in right onto the EXP2 on the printer board. And then uh, he shows you the, the links. There may be a blog post on it. Um, he shows you the pinout to uh, 
break that out to these Chinese boards. The downside of that is those uh, Chinese boards don't, um, they have an SD card slot, but it doesn't work. So the, the curiosity in me wonders if this new hex firmware, um, we would, maybe we'd be able to tap into the Chinese board with the SD card using the new hex file. So that's what I'd like to try. So anyway, I can post about that uh, pinout so that, that you know. It's online. You can find the guy, but uh, there's a couple other guys that were like, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> and I think they might even use different pins. So um, even though the, the printer board is, you know, it's old school. It uses some older drivers. What's nice about it is it's just so easy to use. And the M codes, if you have a printer bot already, it's just so easy to use. If you were to upgrade to uh, something with more features, you'd have to invest a lot of money. And so I'd just love to give a solution to people that own that old board, old printer. They want to add an LCD screen and move their SD card. So that's what I'm, I'm talking about. So anyway, remind me about that tomorrow, and we can uh, all write a little paragraph or two for that blog post. All right. Uh, OK, so this is, which should I do first? Oh, I want to do an uh, Adopt-a-Bot update. So we have come to the end of, you know, I've been using up parts that I've had laying around and just basically giving them away. I mean, for very, very cheap. We put together a big kit that you could just order, and then you create your parts, and you're good. Well, that's going to change, and here's how it's going to change. Um, I want to list, uh, what I want to do is list the bomb, and this is something else we could do tomorrow. Um, I want to list the bomb with links to where, on, let's say, Amazon.com, uh, that you could source uh, motors and and uh, there may be part this may be partly done already um, motors and the things that you need to build this adopt a bot by self sourcing so I've been talking about it uh, I talked about it months ago but um, the idea is I don't have to put together spend extra money and time my wife God bless her is the one that puts those together so when one is ordered she's doing that and she's been trying to use up she does wiring so she's been trying to use up old wire and stuff. Um, but I want to make it easy still to order, uh, like basically Amazon, here's the stuff on Amazon, and here's the stuff on PrinterBot um, that go together to uh, make this not reliant on me, because I can be slow, because it's kind of, uh, anyway, Margie has uh, better things to do than to chase old wires around and make them work. So we want to make it, keep it easy to use, but you may want to choose a different board. You may want to choose a different hot end. You may want to choose different motors than the stuff I've been shipping. So I'm out of motors that were uh, ones that I can't really use. Um, I'm out of bearings on the 8 millimeter bars. I can order more, but uh, there's really no need to because no printers I build anymore use them. Um, so I'm not giving up on Adopt-a-Bot. I'm trying to make it easier for people to go do that without uh, me being the slowdown point, and the sourcing will become, I think, a lot more clear. So um, I think it's an advance. It's a move forward to show that we're truly uh, agnostic on what parts or printer companies or electronics, whatever, um, that you use. But it's still pretty easy to order. Uh, you can order once on PrinterBot and once on Amazon, and you're, you're good to go. And then I don't have to track all my old stuff. It's just you know, I've used a lot of it. I know that one of the things I will uh, put up for sale is there's these small little six-inch bars that were uh, way back on the uh, simple maker's kit. Um, and we have a lot of them. So I'm going to sell them for like a buck a piece or something really cheap. Five bucks for the set or something like that. Um, those I can sell. And there's some other things that uh, I might be able to, to put in the store that make it a little easier. Because Amazon's not going to have everything. Like one example is the wiring for <coughs> the hot end is specific because we've chosen a very specific uh, Molex connector that has a clip where you can't pull it apart, and it's not a cheap Chinese clip. This is real Molex stuff. It's not a knockoff. These are very high quality, and we are picky on the uh, size of wire and the quality of wire that we use for our wiring, so we make it all here, and you know we want to make sure it still has high quality, so you can't really source wires of a certain length with this on the end, so I'll put together a little wiring pack that's like for any printer, like, and I'll make the wires a little bit too long probably for Adopt-a-Bot, but you could use those, that wiring pack, if you chose a uh, printer bot 
pod end or Ubis 13S or one of our other ones. And it'll be easy to build up a printer with like a cheap printer board and the wiring kit and the uh, hot end. So that's the plan with Adoptabot, so watch for that. Um, Oh, that reminded me. Oh, uh, the printer boards. Now, did I mention this already? That do we have some older printer boards in stock now? So I've uh, I, I hate throwing things away, and so I've got some uh, boxes of returned boards, and you know it's all various reasons. Sometimes, yeah, something breaks, you blow a driver. Well, that can be fixed actually. Um, there's a lot of stuff that can be fixed on those old boards, so I've kept them around. Well, we're going through them now, and it's surprising how many of them just work right out of the box. Now, they are used, so the, the uh, they're, I guess, refurbed is the right word, refurbished. Um, but we do have various models of the printer boards for sale at a lower price. So do you know off the top of your head what the prices are for the various versions? Okay. So we've started with the F5. That's one, and that's actually what's on this. That's one version, well, it's a couple versions back. But the F6 has two versions, the Micro SB, and we've kind of dumped that, and we've just gone with the USB-B. It's that big blocky, like the printer. looks like a little house when you stare at the end. Um, it's a very robust connection. It's like on the board, really tight. So if you pull on that wire, it's not going to pop off the Micro SB. SD, uh, SB, USB. Um, so anyway, we've got the USB-B for sale. Those are new. Uh, we've got the F6 now for sale. The USB-B or how much, Dave? 69? 59? I think they're 69. So the F5s are $49, so that's quite a bit less. And then I'm going to also put the, what's the next one down? Rev D, uh, probably our most common um, back in the day. The Rev D, what did we decide on the price on that? Okay. So um, that's something else we can get Jonathan on tomorrow. But anyway, so I'd like to sell the Rev D. If some people have an older printer that they want to replace the board, but it's also nice. The F5 and the Rev D um, have the distinction that you don't have to use the sensor. So it doesn't have 12 volts on that Z end stop, it has 5. And the F5 is selectable. You can do either. But going back to the RevD, if you have a, a bot or a little uh, robot or some project that you're working on that uses end stops or doesn't need them, the, the RevD might be a cheap option. And we're still going to put the same warranty on those. So even though they are refurbished, well, we will support those as if they're new. And uh, there's no real risk as far as from new to refurbished. Because I'll back you up, and if anything breaks on it in that warranty period, I'll be happy to replace. So I wanted you to know that that's coming in the store. So let's get the Rev-D when we get a few. shouldn't take long. So anyway, that's that. All right, now the updates about the new stuff. So why am I building this printer tank? <laughs> Honestly, it's a couple of reasons. Number one is for fun. It, I'm kind of enamored with this little guy. Um, and here's the reason. I've got the printer belt that at a high price that when we do release it, it'll be $1,500 and I think $2,500. They're very unique. They're totally experimental. Now, uh, Bill from Polar3D, like I've, already, I've told you, he's made it possible for the firmware to have a post processor, I'm sorry, the cloud software to have a post processor in it, which all that means is it takes a regular file that you have and it does the funky stuff needed to output the G-code to work on a printer belt. Um, these belt-style printers, I think you're going to see more of them. I know it's the black belt guy. Um, you know, he's still barking about his patents and whatnot, whatever. Um, but he did like a rep-wrap version with extrusion. And he's like, I'm going to release the files when it goes on sale and all that. Well, uh, whatever. Um, but this isn't a belt. Uh, this is, it works just like the belt, but this, uh, works. I think I have it. Let's connect. I, I still have to dial in the, the Z. I was doing that a minute ago. It was working. Um, let's see. Oh, it's still not working. Let me try that again. Anyway, so the X and Y are working on this. Um, I have to connect the end stops. Let me try one more time. Yeah. 
So uh, the X is working, the Y is working. But when I hit Z, I might have the motors inversed or the steps per millimeter I haven't even touched yet. All right, I mean, I increased it, but I got to figure out the math. So this uh, is two motors on the Z. It works just like a printer belt. It'll let me turn this off. Come on. So what's it, what it's going to do is it's going to print an X and Y. And then it's going to move back just a little bit. And it's going to print again. And it's going to move back. And it's going to print again. So when you, when you back this thing up, it's going to leave the print on the table or the floor or whatever you're doing. So the reason I kind of dig this is it's a lower uh, price to enter. Um, I do have a 3D printed version that I'm going to do. I was tweaking that, but I noticed, you know, just because I love the way it looks, I used a couple of sanding belts. And the reason for that is it has a lot of grip. And so you don't want a tire that just, you know, just a little rubber tire on a dusty floor. It might not get purchase on the floor. And actually, one of the problems is this is a very light little machine. Um, so if you don't have a lot of weight and you don't have a lot of grip on those tires or wheels and you move it too fast, it's going to slip. And, you know, you're going to – it's kind of like uh, if one of your axes slip and then it's printing off to the side and, you know, everything's askew. Um, so I got to go very slow in the, in the Z. This is geared. Uh, these two Z motors are totally geared with the paste extruder gears. I did, you can't see it, but I did design 3D printed um, little cylinders with a one millimeter crown in the cylinder. So on the ends of the cylinder, they're smaller than the middle. The reason that is, is I went and studied some, I think I mentioned this, but I went to Lowe's and, or Home Depot and was looking at the belt sanders and that's how they keep the, they adjust one of those rounded uh, cylinders and that will keep the belt running straight. So once you dial this in, it, the calibration is going to be weird because you're going to have to drive it a long way to make sure it's going straight. But, you know, the prints probably will be pretty small. I mean, this is a very small build volume. Um, it's just a couple inches tall, three inches tall or something. And roughly around four inches wide, a little less, and then as long as you want. But uh, most people will probably just do uh, play around with it and do parts, you know, one after the other. <coughs> now, I don't have discrete Z motors yet. So, but when I add a extruder board, I'll be able to turn this thing after a print, not during, but I'll be able to turn it and you could kind of print in a circle or a spiral or something like that. Um, but anyway, this is just for fun. I'm going to take it to the Midwest Rep Rap Festival if everything works out on it. Um, just for grins, release the files, and then make sure there's a 3D printed version of this. I tend to uh, design in something that's fast, so depending on the design, th these tre this tread system is just, it's big enough where it's a pain to wait for the prints that are six inches long. So I just said, screw it. I changed it all over to wood. It's not the strongest in the world um, in this version. I mean, I'll probably just release these files and not worry about how crappy it is. <laughs> Because I think more people will have access to a 3D printer than a laser cutter, but the laser cut files go fast. And so I'm able to like test the concept and then switch it over to something that's a little more accessible. But I'm happy to release the files on both. And then I think even better would be a, a small version of this that is metal um, because I could dump all of these and just go to linear rails. I've got some short linear rails that I'd love to use. So that will dramatically reduce the like visual impact of this, and metal can be just very few pieces, yet even stronger, because this, this stuff does flex. I mean, I think you can see here, look, there's twist in the middle, but if you had aluminum plate on the back here, there'd, there'd be very little twist, depending on the size I use. So I'll uh, get this done, get it in a printed, make sure it works, get it in a printed model, release those files. I'm not going to worry about it too much. It's not a product, it's a project. Um, and then I'll do a serious one that learns from, you know, testing and do a metal version that's uh, ver very minimal. And there is a chance that you could just, uh, like I even thought about putting, a, like, you know, those line follower bots, they have uh, two wheels. You can use all kinds of different 3D print your wheels. Um, if you get some NinjaFlex or something that has a little grip, uh, I think you could do this much slimmed down, uh, like really, really small with two drive wheels here and then just a caster or something like a marble on the table or something on the back, even just a piece of plastic that keeps it 
at the same level, but we'll roll back. So I don't think it has to be this big, but I like the way it looks. It reminds me of Halo a little bit, the Halo tank. <laughs> but anyway, so this is for fun, but I think if we get something out there that can let people experiment with the printer belt or the belt style system, use the Polar 3D Cloud to do the slicing. I can do the motor directions all identical to the models that um, of printer belt that I'm going to do. We'll get some data and some feedback on how it is to use one of those machines and if it's worth anything because I'm not going to bet, you know, my livelihood on this crazy idea that is, it does work, but will people want it is the question, you know what I mean? I, ha I kind of had a knee-jerk reaction when I released that for the first time in beta and I was like, okay, people, here it is, and it was like crickets, you know, a few people ordered, but not very many. So I was like, okay, maybe it's price, maybe, I don't know what, but uh, I would love more people to have access to that. So maybe a 3D printed model that even has a belt on it, a very small belt, um, so that you can see how that works. It's, it is neat to see parts come off of it one after the other, but um, it's not really real or it's not going to be a product until we know that the concept is something that people want. Yeah, well you can print these long things. Mosaic was like, you did what? And they were like, yeah, let's put that multicolor printer on the printer belt. Well, yeah, that's the idea. Um, to make that work so well that multicolor, as long as you want, or as many parts as you want, to be awesome. But it's just so different. So uh, we're going to start by just playing around a little bit. All right, so I'm going to get this out of the way and then show you the CNC updates, and that'll be it. If you have a question you'd like to ask, get it in the little chat room. Let me just grab that. Just set it somewhere. Okay. All right, well, everything isn't hooked up. We were in a mad dash today. Uh, you know, sometimes I get my guys running in circles with all the stuff I want to get done in a day, and I'm just really happy to have this in its, in its current state. So this is the CNC I've been working on, and if you had a side-by-side -side comparison, it looks pretty similar. But what I did is we went through, me and Mark went through the design, and I asked the question, so how can we reduce the amount of material that we use? How can we lower the price for the end user? How can we make this more straightforward, easier to build? Dump all the fluff. Take out the stuff that doesn't work real well. Use more conventional things. So this is what we came up with. And Mark just did a fantastic job. I mean, I, got it, I just give him a, a laundry list. And he, he's so good. He takes notes on every little laundry list. And you can see on his desk, he just hits them one at a time. He's very organized, so when he's done, unlike me, the model and the file structure in Fusion 360, it just looks beautiful. And I said, you're pretty organized in your design. He goes, yeah, pretty organized. And I said, so you ready for me to release the files today? And then he looked at me like, well, maybe tomorrow, or maybe I need a little time. Uh, so I want to get this bare bones up for sale. I was hoping to do it today, but just not realistic. Um, so we're going to try to do this either tomorrow, but I need to go over the bomb or uh, next week. And so the bare bones kit will look like this. We're going to start small. We're going to start with these, f these four plates. There's actually two. Uh, I'll show you the difference between these two designs and there's two each. So those are four plates. And then these are identical on both sides. So adding in these two plates. And then there's a, a single large plate here with uh, the carriage on the front has a plate. And then we've gone back to a little plate on the top that's just water jet. So what we've done is take out a whole bunch of parts. Now we used to have a sandwich layer of two plates. It just drives the cost up. And we didn't think that the rigidity that uh, we gained from an outside plate and these motors, or I mean these uh, Delrin wheels going all the way through, we didn't think it was a big enough payoff. So we remove those, and sure enough, this moves. It's got the belts tight on these two sides. And the, the motors run right here. There's two motors behind here. So this doesn't have a motor yet, but man, it is so smooth and buttery and rigid. So I love it. And this mechanism here, we've gone around and around about this, but we finally got the right belt, and you can tension it easily. And it's just really silky, silky smooth going up and down, no problem. So much more straightforward 
less materials, you can actually access all of the nuts and bolts and stuff when you had that sandwich. Um, it was hard to get in there and, and do your thing. So it's lowered the cost of this. So I'm going to be able to beat the 999 price that I talked about. So tomorrow um, I'll do, or like I said, next week early, I'll do the, uh, the bomb and I'll get a real price and a real product. So this is very close. Now the other thing that it did was we did have these squared off but then you had a gap here of unused, you really didn't need the extrusion to go out to here. You didn't need this spoiler board to go out to here. And so we've saved like that much extrusion times however many and uh, that much spoiler board. And you can see that, let's see, there's still a little bit of waste on the sides. I can even come down a little bit more. But I want uh, the ability to bolt off to this, you know, the screw a spoiler board down uh, if you don't have a vacuum table or whatever. So I haven't measured uh, how this machine is set up. I just used the old rails. Um, but this, is, this machine, the CNC system, is all configurable to the lengths that you want. So the bare bones, you will have to order your own extrusion. It's FazTech extrusion. You could use, I haven't tested this, but I'm hoping. Um, I'll get some Mis Mitsumi rail in there. Some people like that. It's more expensive, um, so that's why I don't use it. But it is very square, and you know it works fine. The other thing too is our Delrin wheels are actually more expensive than Open Builds. Open Builds is a good site, open source designs, and they have a store where they sell their open source stuff. One thing I don't like about them is they did go and create a extruded aluminum. It was cool if they needed it and it was didn't exist in the world. That's cool. But it does kind of force people down the path of buying their extrusion. And I kind of hate that just as a value. Um, I want you to be able to size up your machine any way that you want to. You could go smaller and just go for rigidity. You could go larger j and get crazy. Some people just, I'm going to make a 15-foot long CNC. Well, you know what? <laughs> Knock yourself out. Because these plates will bolt to the end of just rails that are cut. And Faztec will cut them to length for you with their really nice machines. And they'll uh, tap the ends because there's two screws on the ends of, ends of these. They'll do that and you won't have to worry about any of that. So it makes it a really nice marriage between what's cheap, I don't have to mark it up, and what I think is really good um, but doesn't force you down the path to buy from me on some of these, these components that do add cost to a machine. Um, I, I really think that uh, Shapeoko is, is a good CNC machine, but they use this extruded aluminum that's proprietary to them. It's probably their money maker. Um, you just don't have to do that. It works without it. But Open Builds has these different, a little different style of these roller bearings here. So what I decided is, hey, if they're cheaper and uh, we can make it work on this extrusion, um, then let's just use theirs and it'll bring the cost down even further. So we're looking at their, uh, we've ordered some wheels from Open Builds and I'm going to see if I can utilize those, save a little money. And then also uh, there's an eccentric in the bottom wheels, two here, two here, and two here. And that's how you tighten it. The eccentric moves it, you know, up and down, moves the whole wheel up and down based on an off-center hole. And uh, those are actually pretty expensive to make. Um, so I'm checking to see if I can source theirs and see if they can beat my price. So anyway, I'm really keeping an eye on cost, overall cost. So I don't have my E-chain on here. It's much cleaner. Um, but I'll just do a spin around. So we uh, went from 90 degree down to these to save material here. That was a cost savings. We've made it even thinner. And the side, uh, not a big difference, but when you drop that other plate, everything is very accessible here. You've seen this style in other, in other CNC's, um, but it's just very straightforward. Now we did have to move the motor over here just because of how the wheels ride on this uh, extrusion behind. So that looks a little funky, but it keeps it very narrow and we don't gain a lot of extra height that we don't want. This motor stays out of the way. Um, the back is pretty much the same. Uh, oh, you can see that the, the way to tension the belts is uh, these just simple, easy little uh, clamps. So we just went to these really inexpensive clamps. And then you can move the motor up and down. It's on slots. We may put something in here where you can, like, 
a little leverage to help move the motor. Um, but anyway, so I really like how this turned out. I'm very happy with it. And you should be able to upsize this to even crawlbot size. And I've got the extrusion now to prove that. So the bare bones could be any size. The other the back here, I do want to show you. This is kind of in the way, but um, very accessible. You can get to your motor, tighten those up. That was a pain before it was buried. And, you know, you just have this one plate coming off the top. So pretty much off the shelf parts, except for the plates. Uh, it still retains the linear rail in the front. And it's now it's really starting to resonate with me that it's not quite as beautiful because I don't have cover plates, but it saves the trouble of having to have some kind of other skew to add these beauty plates on. I just don't think you need them. And it maintains the footprint as small as possible, and it will be easy to put a plexiglass or polycarbonate um, case over the top of it and remain, you know, pretty small. So you could keep the dust uh, down in your garage, put a shop vac out the back of it or something. So that's the CNC. So that's pretty much it. Uh, how much less, I don't know yet, but believe me, um, I think the viability of this machine really has to do with price. We need a low price of entry and the lowest cost of ownership. Um, now, people always do crazy mods. And so, you know, I've been thinking about the pinion, all of this upgradable stuff, the linear rails, the pinion, and all that. And so what we decided was pinion makes no sense on this um, when it's small. It only makes sense in the Y, the long axis, axis of, like, the crawlbot, the long eight-foot section. And it gets pretty pricey to buy you know, a whole bunch of rail to go that big, build a big table. Um, so I think the more common use of this will be smaller machines than 4x8. Um, so I thought, you know what, let's let go of the rack and pinion for now. Because we know we can get access to this uh, plate and put a hole in it if we need to. We know we can even replace it with a pinion system. Um, so everything's cleared to maintain add that pinion later, but my priority was, what's useful for small machines? Well, entry-level machines, you're going to be happy with belts because your hopes aren't too high. You're not going to be machining metal and try to compete with something that's 10 times the cost. Um, you're going to be doing projects, and mostly in wood and plastic, and probably not a lot of metal. Now, you can do metal, but again, your tolerances have to be realistic for, with belts. So what, what's another thing that we could add? Well rail. So we have added, uh, in the drawing, it's already done, these plates work with linear rail. And you dump the Delrin wheels and you bolt the linear rail uh, right onto the machine. One here, one on the other side, and then one on the, f or two here on the front. So it shifts your Y forward just a little bit, um, but you still maintain the same uh, cutting area. Uh, it might be just like that different. I have to look at the drawing. But anyway, so you can put rail on this as it sits and we will be sourcing the rail to do that because when we did the Plus Pro bare bones and some other bare bones kits, um, people were a little frustrated. It was hard to find the right rail. So my requirement for Mark when uh, he was doing the, uh, the changes was get a rail, a linear rail that's accessible, I mean that's uh, available on Amazon and that has a good price and that isn't some weird length that you have to cut. On the plus, you know, we call out exactly the size we need because if I'm ordering in bulk, uh, it's just the same price for me to get, you know, 333 millimeters as it is 400. I mean, it's weird. And I was building smaller machines, so I'd make them as small as I can. Well, this machine, I want cost to be the factor, so we're only make building, we're recommending this kit uh, be a certain length this way so that you can bolt on stock rails, linear rails, if you do want to go that route and the belt or the we Delrin wheels aren't enough for you. So linear rail upgrade from the beginning. The other thing is ball screw. So this is really, if you have linear rails and ball screw, now you've got a machine that is pretty serious. And so at the back, 
you'll see motor mounts. And these are going to ship with all these plates. We're going to go ahead and eat the cost. If you don't upgrade to this, you'll just have holes <laughs> here anyway. But this, uh, this isn't the right size on this one. But um, So this has an accompanying plate that will mount the motor. Very robust uh, ball screw. It is. It has a bunch of hardware that goes with it, like these mounts for the, uh, oh, I forget what they're called, but they're bearings. Um, so this turns into captured, uh, it's captured in this direction. It's got this big old bearing that holds it in place and keeps it true. It's got a clip on one side uh, to lock in one end, and it's got a nut on the other side to lock in the other end around the bearings. And then the uh, ball screw is very, very, very smooth, and it can be very powerful. So we'll have a little plate that mounts this to this. So you can, there'll be two ball screws for the Y and one across here. And we'll leave the linear rail and uh, this set up for the Z. But again, this is stock. Uh, so there's this one seller on Amazon that has pretty good pricing on their... By the way, uh, they have good pricing on the, the stock links, and they have so many links. And it's a nightmare to even find the one that you want, but we finally found it. And we've got it in the drawing, so when we release the files, you'll see. If you want to source your own ball screws, go for it. If you want to sor source your own rails, go for it. So again, I think it's more likely, this is me, this is what I want, uh, to buy a machine that you know you can upgrade to very robust, even better than what it came later, and I'm not going to try to gouge you for it. Um, I will try to stock those, uh, you know, a number of these so that they can be fast because sometimes you got to wait a little bit from China. Anyway, another thing, when I was carrying this in, um, this thing is light. I mean, it's really pretty light. Um, it's funny. I was talking to my buddy uh, that's a CNC expert, and uh, I was like, oh, man, I want to go really, really fast with these ball screws and stuff. He's like, well, it doesn't really weigh enough to go fast. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, it's just too light. Um, my, his machine was an industrial machine. You know, it was probably $100,000 more. Had a tool changer. I mean, the tool changer was like this. The motor was like 14 horsepower, some ungodly amount. And I uh, don't know what that was. And he says, but the reason it could plow through in a single pass, you know, whatever, half inch, three quarter plywood, is because it had so much mass that when it got going, man, it kept going. And it was a very powerful motor, all kinds of big servo motors and stuff. So this is what it is. It's not going to compete with the professional. It's just, it's just what you need to get into CNC with enough headroom to uh, go up to some very nice equipment that you just, it's hard to find this stuff on the competitor's sites. Um, they pretty much narrow their focus to an audience that only buys, like, Hey, I'm back. Got a couple of questions. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple of questions, and then uh, I'll finish this up. Sorry about the delay there. So, uh, first question. Hey, Brooke, what is that orange arm printed part in the background? This is free for you to download from some company I can't remember. <laughs> but this is a robot arm project. It looks really cool. Um, when we built it, uh, if you don't have geared stepper motors on here, uh, forget about it takes a year and a day to print this thing. Um, we got so discouraged with it because I thought the, the two problems with these 3D printed arms is they look very neat, but when you go to use them, um, they, they move like this. <laughs> you know, they're like bouncing all over the place. And I thought, well, what if we used this other Kickstarter uh, that I backed? I thought it was cool. They had this, you know, you just plug your stepper motor into this little, what essentially is an Arduino, and they have this little magnet encoder on here, and it actually turns your NEMA 17 motor, what's it called? I don't mind plugging them. I just got discouraged with it. This was an early model. It must be on the bottom. Let's say. There's a couple of these out there, but it turns your stepper motor into a servo, because it closes the loop. Instead of open loop, I hope I don't mess up when it's moving. It tracks like, where am I, where am I, where am I, where am I, and it can adjust. So if you took the arm and went like that, it would recover. Um, so it, I thought it was going to be neat, and it ended up just being a pain in the butt, so we gave up. 
Um, also, uh, I wish I could tell you where these files were, but I, li I like the way the design looks. It takes far too long to print this. I own a water jet. I was like, screw it. We'll just water jet parts. Come on, this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and by the way, this I uh, got two other questions, but I want to say one other thing. Um, there, I tweeted about this this week. There is this great, uh, man, I'm over time now. There is this great uh, YouTube video about a guy that was building, he's trying to build a robot arm similar to this. And the problem really is with the backlash on the geared steppers. So when you change directions, you always got to eat up a little gear. You know, the gears aren't super tight. And so uh, it's a little stronger, like four to one ratio. Uh, but it's hard to get a gear train or, you know, a, a little transmission in there that really gives you a, a high uh, gear ratio, like 100 to 1. Um, if you had that, you could use even smaller motors. In fact, that's such a high, you know, this would be s direct drive, 1 to 1. Um, but if you use, I forget what they're called, but in uh, KUKA arms and such, they use extremely expensive, um, this fancy zero backlash gearing. I can't think of the name of it. But there's, uh, it was protected by patents, and they're very expensive to buy, like $400 per motor for this little transmission thing. That's really cool, but you can't use it. I mean, it's too expensive. It's all stainless steel and all this. Works good, but too much for a guy like me. So uh, there's a guy that was exploring what he called, um, it was sort of like a cheap version of those industrials. And he was using uh, H TD belt, I believe, timing belt. And he used thick timing belt to make his uh, outer gear. They had the, ge the teeth on the inside. And that belt flexed enough, you could do this, uh, you could put a couple of rollers with bearings, and it engages an inner gear that is slightly smaller. So you got a, like an outer gear that has 100 teeth, and you got an inner gear that has 99 teeth. And because the inner gear flexes because of the push of these pulleys, um, so the inner gear is actually kind of like an oval shape. And so it engages on both sides and it rolls around a hundred times to 99 times. So uh, it has to roll around 99 times to have the shaft that's connected to it turn once. So the cool thing about that is if, if uh, that were perfected, and this guy on YouTube is trying to perfect it, um, you could put a, like a quadcopter motor that's, you know, five bucks in there and get an enormous amount of power, um, way more than just a, a brush DC motor could do. But a lot of people are just using steppers. The steppers are pretty strong, so you could do like a four, five to one, seven to one, something like that, and get quite a lot of power and no backlash. And so he's using these, it's called a wave. Anyway, the, so he was exploring that. And he got down the road quite far, and then he said, you know what, I'm going to take a break from this, and I'm going to try hypocycloidal gears. Hypocycloidal gears are really weird. You ought to Wikipedia that. It's these weird, instead of sharp teeth on your gears, it's these like oblong gears. And they roll across uh, pins, and so it kind of like scoots around this pin, and then it's already grabbing on the next one. So by changing over to hypocycloidal gears, uh, he was able to make a m almost zero backlash. I say almost because theoretically you can't have zero. Um, but it was a very, very low backlash, uh, four or five to one gear ratio. He thinks it might be enough to power this robot arm that he's working on. And it was like laser cut parts. So I did spend a part of a whole day this week um, going down that rabbit hole and I was able to use his ideas. And I mean, I've seen it on Wikipedia, and I've visited this before because I'm fascinated with these gears. Um, because I would really love to build a robot arm with adequate, zero, adequate power, zero backlash. Um, it would open up what you could do with a home-built robot if you had these gear trains. So um, once I get that gear working, uh, mine just bolts on to a NEMA 17. There's other guys out there. In fact, one guy on my uh, Twitter account said, hey, I'm working on the same thing. I think it would be cool to use that for a drive gear, but you know, you wouldn't have to put it on a 3D printer. You could use it on the robot. Wow. Okay, number two. Uh, are you, there's only two more. 
Are you going to sell the wheels that are on the CNC machine? So these Delrin wheels are produced by us. I, we just designed them as what we thought they should be. And they are what they are, but they're like a little expensive to make. It has two 608ZZ roller bearings in it. So they are inexpensive, but yeah, we, we sell, I don't know if we sell them now, but we stock them because they, they're used on the Crawlbot. And they've worked out really well for that. So we'll either make these and sell them separately if you have them wear out or whatever. Sometimes they can get a groove in them if you're not. If you actually put them on here and you cut into them when you roll them on and you don't have your eccentrics loose, you can damage the wheels and you hear this dink, 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 dink. It won't show up in your cut, but it bugs me. So, uh, yeah, you might want to replace these over time. We would either sell them or just use the open builds design and I'll, I'll build those or just buy them probably from open builds so they can make some money and I can save some money. But yeah, uh, that's the only thing on here that's really proprietary, the eccentrics and the bearings. But if they work with open builds, then they wouldn't be proprietary, which is what I want. Last question, unless you got anything else, Dave. Uh, it's not even a question, it's a comment. <laughs> Getting some spaceship vibes from the CNC. It is a little bit funky. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, I like it. it. Mark drew it, and, and I said, what do you think about the new design? He was like, I don't know if I hate it or I like it. So we put it together, and I says, I don't care what you think. I like it. Uh, so I dig it. It is a little bit funky, and I like that in my design. So, so thank you, Mark. Anyway, so yeah, it's still just going to be called the PrinterBot CNC. Um, this might be the size that's the, the benchtop CNC, but there'll be another size that's called something else, and then the CrawlBot will be based on the same system, but a, of a certain size. So, All right, anything else, Dave? Give me one. Best way to replace, oh, Simple Pro? No, the, the original, like the V1 assembly, the white one, that block CNC. Oh. Best way. best way to replace the oh, bearing block? So, well, you guys mean like the wide Yeah, those are not a part that were designed to be, uh, have the bearings replaced, to be honest. So, what you could do is, uh, what, what could you do? Well, you could... You could build a part, a little pulley puller, <laughs> to pull those bearings out. Or we could work out something offline. Uh, I've probably got a few here that would pass as better than yours. Um, I've got some that are unused uh, but might have a scratch in them or something. So we could probably do a swap. Um, I've, I've got probably 50 of those, maybe more. Um, but I'm the same like you. Well, well, now what do I do with these? I need to replace one bearing in them. So with a press and a, a tool that I build, I might be able to get those out. So why don't we let him uh, just ask for a replacement. If you want to pay shipping, I'll help you get them replaced. I'd love, I mean, that's one thing with 3D printing. Um, I'd love to be able to design stuff that I water jet and share those with the world and have those be of use. But since you don't have a water jet, I can't really design a tool to remove those. But I know it's possible because we got them in there. So you, I know you got to be able to get them out. It's hard. So, sorry about that. All right. Well, good to see you guys. Uh, what's next week? Uh, am I here next week? I, I just never know when the Rep Rap, Rep Rap Festival is coming. So, yeah, I'm here next week. So, I'll see you next week. Same time, place. Hope you have a good week, good weekend. Happy printing. <laughs>